Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus said. He gave us that promise in John chapter 11, the promise that he would rise and that he would not only rise for himself, but rise for each of us. May this truth, may this joy sustain us each and every day of our lives. Today, as we come together, we are closing up a series. We've talked about the I am statements of Christ. We've talked about how he has been present, how he is the great I am, the Lord who dwells among us. He has said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the vine. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But most importantly now, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. It seems to be a summary in itself itself. It seems as though we wouldn't need to say any more because as we hear that promise, I am the resurrection and the life, we know that it was not merely a promise that was made that He would rise, but we would rise with Him. That He is the resurrection. He is the life eternal for each one of us. And so on Easter Sunday, each year we come together. We come together to honor Him and to praise Him. We come together to say, Lord, You are the great I Am. You are the one who has defeated death for me. But that wasn't exactly the response of the first Christians, was it? That wasn't, in in fact, the the way our gospel ends today is a bit awkward, wasn't it? Did anybody catch that right at the end of our gospel today? In Mark 16, it ends on a, well, sad note, really. Trembling and bewildered, the, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. What a strange way to end. Here we are coming together and we sing, Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. We sing and we praise the Lord. We shout for joy. We, our readings promise us that resurrection. But the women, they were trembling. They were bewildered. As they looked into the grave, they, they were scared, if anything. They had come into contact with an angel. And as they looked into the grave, as they, as they saw that angel, they were already, they, their emotions were already running high. Consider what they'd been through the last Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Here they'd already experienced some of the high, highest highs and the lowest lows of their lives. Here they were already on an emotional roller coaster. And on top of that, now they're looking into the tomb of their Savior. But instead of being empty, there's an angel. Now we see throughout Scripture how angels have just completely and totally Well, let's put it this way. They're not those cute little cupids we see flying across the sky. But the angels that we see in Scripture, they are powerful and they are mighty. And they are are scary. And so with terror, the women left the tomb bewildered. Quiet. A bit of sense of awe, a bit of sense of shock. Now, it didn't keep them quiet, though, did it? Because they went and we know they later told the disciples. But at first, they didn't know what to say. They were caught up in the moment, caught up in what had happened. But of course, anybody who has seen the the angel, anybody who has heard the good news that he is risen, he is not here. They cannot keep it inside. It exploded from them. But that reminds me of the disciples then. Where were they in all of this? Where were they at the tomb? It talks about these three women who went to the tomb. They went and they went to care for their Savior out of love and out of mercy. But we know from John's Gospel exactly where they were. They were locked up in their house. They had closed the door, turned the key, and they were worried. They were worried about what was to happen. They were worried about what was coming. They had seen the miracle of Christ. They had walked with Jesus for three years. But they didn't know. John and Peter, they they ended up going to the tomb. But even as they looked in the tomb, they scratched their heads bewildered. Can we blame them? Can we blame them for the response? Can we blame the women? Can, can we blame the disciples? Just consider what they saw. The last they'd seen Jesus was his lifeless body being taken down from the cross. The last they'd seen him, he had no breath in him. They had watched as a soldier pierced his side and his blood and water ran out. They watched as he had been taken to the tomb. Unable to do anything to stop them. But there's another perspective. Not only do we see the perspective of the disciples or the ladies, but what about the soldiers? In Matthew's Gospel, it talks about the fact that soldiers were stationed in front of the tomb. The chief priests and the Pharisees, they claimed that they were worried that Jesus' disciples would steal the body. So they posted soldiers. Matthew tells us that as the soldiers stood there, though, when they saw the angel descending, when they saw the rock rolled away, 
They were like dead men. They were completely frozen in place. There is no way they could respond and no way they could do anything to stop the resurrection of the Lord. But can you blame them? The best they had heard is rumors about Jesus. The most that they had heard were, were the stories that people had told. He was a religious teacher to them, if anything. And so they had a bit of an excuse maybe compared to the disciples or the ladies. But how would you have responded? How would you respond if you were there that first Easter? How would you have responded if you, would, if you were to stand there? If you were to see the angel of the Lord right in front of you? Well, I don't know about you, but I think as I think about standing in front of an angel of the Lord, if every other person who's ever stood in front of an angel of the Lord has been scared to death, I imagine the same. But I think as we, as we look at it, as we hear this Easter message, we have at least three different ways that we can respond. The ways that Christians respond. We can respond as the ladies do. Some Christians will do this. They'll hear the message. They'll hear the good news of the resurrection. At first, it will leave us in awe. It will leave us in wonder. Because how on earth could someone rise from the dead? And I think that's the way that some Christians will respond. At first, being with the words caught up in their throat, not being able to say another word, but then having to share. Then having to share their thoughts and having to share the wonder of what they have just witnessed. Some Christians will respond like the disciples. They'll hear the good news. They've seen the wonder of what Christ has done. But they'll close, go back home. They'll close the door and they'll take siege. Many Christians do this because they're scared of what is going on in the world today. They're scared of the, the, the people who are evil, the people who are sinful, those people who are against Christians, and so they'll bury their faith and close the door and lock it and stay safe. Or some Christians may respond as the soldiers did. Some Christians will observe the wonder of the resurrection, but it will also cause great terror to, to run through them. Because they'll realize that throughout their life that they haven't taken time to get to know their Lord. They haven't taken time to study their scriptures and they haven't taken time to, to pray and take time to speak to the Lord. How will you respond? It would be easy to limit it to those three ways, isn't it? But the truth is we live in the real world. We know that there's so many different responses and so many different ways that, we, that as we look at our Savior and we look at the resurrection story, that there's not just one way that we may respond. There's not just one corner of our life. And that's why it's not bound up in us. That's why it's so important that it's not about who we are or what we do. Because so often when we focus on what we do and who we are, we find someone who is sorely lacking. We find someone who has failed to keep God's law, who has failed to honor God's will. When we look at our lives, we see someone who has not lived up to what God has designed us to do, to the way He has led us to, to go, to le the way He has led us in our lives. And that is what truly makes the resurrection story miraculous. It isn't about the fact that Jesus rose, but it is the fact that He rose for us. I know it's just two short words, but for us, the fact that Jesus rose for us, he didn't need to declare victory for himself. He already knew, but he declared victory for us because as we are sinful people, as Paul says in Romans, we will be buried with him, but we will also rise with him. The good news message that we have on Easter Sunday is not as that Christ has done it for sinful sinners just like you and I. That He has given His life for each one of us, no matter where we are, no matter who we are, no matter how we have lived our lives. Our Lord and Savior gave His life so that we would know that it was not about us, but about Him and about His salvation. And so how do we respond? to that good news that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? How do we respond when we know that the resurrection and the life took on human form and He dwelt among us? How do we respond when we know that Jesus cared enough for you and for me to give His whole life? Each day, He gives us the opportunity to share our faith to share His love with others. Each day He gives us an opportunity to respond to Him, to respond to what He has done in our lives. Each day He fills us with life. He gives us the op opportunity to share that love with others. 
And each day, He reminds us again of, his, of how great He loves us. Because the resurrection story is not meant for one day a week. It's not meant for one day a year. It's not meant to just be remembered on Sunday mornings. But the resurrection story is for every day of the week. The resurrection story is for each and every day of our lives. So that each day we may know the joy and promise that our Lord has given His life for us. And He rose and defeated death. He defeated the power of the devil. He defeated all that was against us. And He has given us this gift. Because isn't that the promise that Jesus is the resurrection? Isn't that the promise that He is the life? Not only the promise that we will have life with Him eternally, but the promise that each day we have life with Him. The promise that He will give us the, li- the strength we need, that He will sustain us and support us, that He will take us through the times that are hard on our lives, that He will take us through the happy times. How many times have you seen the promise of your Lord, the promise of your Savior, not only on Sunday, but each and every day? Each and every day as He has walked with you. So how do you respond? a good question because here we sit at a crossroads tomorrow the next day by next Sunday will you remember the words that you heard today that Jesus Christ is risen he is not here will you remember those words each and every day it's a hard challenge isn't it because there are so many things that happen in our lives There are so many things that happen in our lives that are not good, that are painful things. There are so many things that happen in our lives each day that distract us from the resurrection. There are so many things that happen in our lives that make us wonder, did he rise? But he did. He is risen. He is not here. May we know this. May we know this joy. May we know this peace. And may we know this comfort each day. Let us pray. Christ Jesus, we give thanks to you for giving your life for us. We give thanks that you have given your life on the cross, that you suffered, that you died, that you were buried, but that you rose for us. Help us each day to know the full, assur- well, the full assurance of our salvation. Help us to know that the promise that you have given us this day is a promise that you, that you keep each and every day. That you, as you are the resurrection and the life, that you, keep in, that you guard and keep us. Lord, help us to know that there is never a time that we are without you. That there is never a time that we are doing it on our own because you, you, you carry us through. You are our strength. You are our support. You are the life that we need. And you have promised us that on the last day, you will give us life eternal with you forever. May this be the promise that supports us each and every day. In your name we pray. Amen.